So welcome everyone to our uh, another session of South Bay Soaring Society Wednesday night program. And we're still virtual and I, I'm enjoying it because we get some great uh, videos on our Zoom uh, calls. And because of this, I'm able to get uh, one of our favorite uh, presenters, uh, Greg Fogel, Gary Fogel in uh, San Diego at the Torrey Pines uh, Club. And he's, he's spoken to us several times and, and particularly about um, John Montgomery who in, Invented the glider, the, the full size right. glider, right? Uh, right, about twenty miles from where we meet. Uh, actually, probably five miles from where we meet. And uh, we've he writ, he's written books about it. He's spoken to us. And if you check out our YouTube uh, site, you'll see we probably have about three or four recordings of, of Gary talking about his various books and the history of um, of Santa Clara Valley and Silicon Valley's uh, part in in aviation. And funny enough. He uh, just gave a talk at Oakland uh, Library, and he was speaking about uh, the Bay Area, mostly a little bit of San Diego and a little uh, bit of New Mexico, a lot of New Mexico. Right. Um, but uh, it was great to hear another part about another part of our aviation history. So, without further ado, I'll introduce Gary, or Gary can introduce himself. And yeah, thanks. Great. I appreciate it. It's always great to be back with SBSS. And uh, yeah, so the next the new book that I have out is called um, Skyrider. Park Van Tassel and the Rise of Ballooning in the West. And it features, a, again, a gentleman named Park Van Tassel, who is an early pioneer of aerial exhibition, um, a pioneer that tried to get into ballooning uh, as early as really, you know, as early as it came to, to the Western America. Ballooning came to the West in about 1850s. 1853 was the first flight of a balloon west of the Rockies, actually at Oakland was the first recorded flight. And it took some time for the balloon to kind of get itself around the American West. Park Van Tassel was one of these people that, that took it around the American West, doing exhibitions for paying customers that had never seen anyone go up in a balloon before. And he would go by rail from city to city doing these exhibitions as his career, as his livelihood. Uh, and that was a very foreign way of making money in the 1880s, uh, you know, when the Old West was the Old West. Uh, just it wasn't the case that anyone was doing those things. Um, he helped uh, invent ballooning for New Mexico. Of course, New Mexico now is a hotbed of ballooning and internationally regarded as a balloon capital of the world. Uh, he was the first to fly a balloon in New Mexico. Uh, then also was first to fly a balloon in Utah, first to fly a balloon in Colorado, uh, also in Portland, Oregon made trips throughout the Northwest, and later um, made the Bay Area his home uh, in the 1890s, and then left the Bay Area to make a worldwide trip with balloons and parachutes as exhibition, coming back to Oakland in the 1900s and uh, living out a very long life. A more modern picture of, of hot air ballooning today, we know uh, the grace and beauty and color of these things. And I had the great fortune of being back at the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta three weeks ago or so. Uh, Balloons today are we take it for granted and they're so colorful and amazing. It's very easy to control your altitude. You've got a propane burner to go up. You'd let the balloon cool to come down um, or you have a, a vent. Uh, much different than it was, you know, way back when. And in these early periods of ballooning in the 1700s, um, they're very, very dangerous time to go up in anything. Uh, but these are the first flights by, by man. Uh, and typically in France first, and it took some time for those to come to America. So first flight of a balloon in America is 1792 on the East Coast. Uh, the Founding Fathers were watching George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin were all there watching this uh, sort of SpaceX launch at the time uh, of Jean-Pierre Blanchard going up in a balloon. Uh, similarly in France, the parachute was invented in 1797 uh, by Garnerin, and it was a, a sort of rigid parachute. Uh, he went up in a balloon and jumped out with a parachute. Uh, and survive the fall with the parachute. It took, again, 120 years uh, for that to come to America with Giel making the first parachute jump in New York. And as I mentioned, it took really a long time for the balloon to come to California. Uh, and Oakland was the first place. There was this gentleman that had planned to make a balloon exhibition in August of 1853, but they tried to inflate the, the balloon with gas and it just wasn't enough lifting power to get that gentleman's weight off the ground. So they found a 16 year old boy nearby guy named Joseph Gates, and they convinced him to go up with no experience at all. And he went up for the first flight in a balloon in uh, not only Bay Area, Bay Area history, but Western US history and survived. So in, 1890, in 1881, Park Van Tassel and his wife Ella moved from the Bay Area to Albuquerque. Uh, and this is about the same time as the OK Corral at Tombstone. So you get the idea of the Old West. 
and he becomes a saloon keep uh, operating this tavern called the Elite at the Opera House in what was then Newtown, Albuquerque, which is downtown now. Um, he ships a balloon from San Francisco, again, having done several, just a couple of different uh, balloon flights and trials, but no success in California. He ships this balloon out to see if he can have some success um, on July 4th of 1882. So he proposes making a, an ascension for the entire town on Independence Day. And this requires what's called coal gas inflation. So they burn coal in an anoxic environment and take the effluent off, the gas off, uh, because it's lighter than air. And that whole process takes two days to inflate this gas balloon, uh, about two thirds full only. And uh, this is the same gas that was used in the town to illuminate uh, the lights and stuff at nighttime. So the customers are unable to use the gas for two days. And they, uh, they finally get it uh, together two thirds full. It's, it's July 4th, you better go up. And he goes up at 6.15 in the evening, uh, making a flight to 14,000 feet as measured by his barometer and landed safely uh, near Old Town. Not only is that Van Tassel's first successful flight, it's the first successful flight by anyone in all of New Mexico. Wow. And we have one photo of that event. This is the, the photo from that day. You can see the size of the balloon and the, and the ring holding it all together and everyone gathered around <laughs> to, to wish, wish Mark Van Tassel goodbye because <laughs> no one knew if it was actually gonna work or not, and it did. Uh, his first balloon flight, um, so pretty amazing. He he leaves for, for Utah directly after that. His wife uh, comes to California. It's not clear if they had a falling out or this was part of the plan. And he goes to Salt Lake City. Uh, the next year makes another flight, July 4th, 1883. First flight in Utah. Uh, this is with a monkey as his passenger. He goes to 15,000 feet, successful flight. He makes a second flight in Salt Lake City uh, later that same month. This is with Miss Fan Mrs. Fanny Hoyt. Uh, someone else's wife. And the fact that a married man, Mr. Park Van Tassel, took another woman, uh, another married woman, uh, up aloft for six and a half hours flying in a balloon, that made the news. That was like, wow, that's amazing. And right after that, he leaves for San Francisco. He comes back to San Francisco and he makes this very, very large balloon called the Eclipse. This thing's 110 feet tall, 58 feet in diameter, and can carry three people. So a very large balloon for the time. That was test flown at Central Park, a baseball park in San Francisco, uh, Eighth and Market Streets. And the first flight of this uh, was its own adventure in November. Uh, the winds were out of the west in San Francisco and out of the east on the East Bay. So he ends up being floating out over the bay and he can't get to either side. It's just crazy. All, all day long, he's trying to find currents that will take him either direction to get back to land, can't find him. And he ends up landing in the bay with these two other passengers. That requires a boat rescue. That requires not only rescuing them, but also the balloon. But throughout this, he's got this huge balloon now. He conceptualizes a flight of a balloon all the way across California, over the Sierra Nevada and into Nevada. And that makes national news that some crazy balloonist out in California was thinking about flying all the way over the Sierra Nevada mountains with a balloon. He gets hired uh, to provide a ballooning exhibition to the World's Fair in New Orleans. Uh, in March of 1885 as a now expert of ballooning, Professor Park Van Tassel. Um, there were a few other people doing balloon exhibitions at this time around America, but he's, he's brought there as an expert. He makes a, 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 an inflation to only about 4,000 feet because they still have problems getting the gas in the balloon. Uh, and he lands up landing on the, on the west side of the Mississippi River. He steps out of the balloon in the swamp and the balloon takes back off again and goes bounding across the Mississippi River to the other side. <laughs> he has to figure out how to get it back again. Uh, it ends up being its own recovery issue, but he gets it back eventually, and that generates more favorable press for him. He's now uh, regarded as a sort of not only someone who, an expert, but you know, really the great Van Tassel. Someone knows so much about ballooning. He's going to the World's Fair only a couple of years after having some success in in New Mexico and Utah. He comes back to California and he divorces his wife Ella and marries a lady named Clara Corkendall. This was his third wife. Uh, she was a very well-to-do lady in San Jose. Uh, the high society parents did not feel very good about this, uh, her, their daughter marrying this crazy cali gallivanting aerial exhibitionist. And so they, they forbid the wedding. They didn't attend the wedding. The wedding happened anyway. And um, with, all the, with all the interest on weddings, Park Van Tassel starts thinking about taking tethered balloons up to the air with, uh, with married couples on board, getting them married in the air with the pastor going on here. Had a hard time finding it. That would That'll never work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I actually did this, but it, but it was hard to find. Um, he makes his own other tour of the West. Uh, again, another July 4th flight, 1886 in Los Angeles. A great flight over an, over an hour over Los Angeles. The entire city seeing this huge balloon up in the air. 
And he now proposes flying all the way from LA all the way across America, which at that time was completely heretical. Like there's no way it's ever gonna happen. Um, and of course now we can do these kinds of things. So it's, he was way ahead of his time. He goes to Colorado, uh, makes what's believed to be the first balloon flight in Colorado's history in August of 1886. Very difficult to get anything to fly at high altitude, Denver being one of those places. Uh, and he also continues on to Kansas City, makes an ascension there, has difficulty with the crowds. So now you think about a person like this traveling on the rails at high expense to take his balloon everywhere. And he has to generate enough money at each place to then pay for the trip. Uh, but when you're doing a balloon, you have an enclosure where people are gonna see you put the balloon together and be part of the coal gas e expansion and things of that nature. But it's very difficult to get anyone to pay to be inside this, this enclosure. Um, when, when if you're outside the enclosure, you can still see the balloon go up. So, uh, so that was a difficulty. He still uh, you know, had a difficulty getting that to work. I have someone at the door. So okay. let, me take, let me take a brief break and I'll be right back. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there. Hey, Ken. Hey, sorry, I didn't get you off an email. I'm literally doing the talk right now with Gary Fogel. Um, I'm recording it. Um, so um, do you need a little introduction written? Okay, I'm back. That wasn't the boss. Uh, one, one second, Gary. I'm talking to your publicist, our publicist on this very topic. Oh, really? Um, oh. But if you... No, well, the, 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 <laughs> why don't I write it? Just wait an, uh, an hour and I'll write it for you and, and set it off. Okay, great. Take it away. Who's that? It's Ken, uh, Ken Peartree. He's our, he's our uh, club secretary, I think. Uh -huh. And um, so we publicize this meeting. <laughs> this is all oh. real time <laughs> happening tomorrow. Oh. Oh, <laughs> well, it's happening uh, Wednesday, so he's yeah, okay. pushing it a little bit. All right, cool. But that's cool. Good. also I thought, did I forget? <laughs> oh jeez. Oh jeez. Okay. All right, but I got through this slide, so I'm ready to go to the next slide. Okay. All right, good. And if I have to stop, I'll try to do the same kind of thing where it stops on a break. All right. So continuing on. So after his adventures in Kansas City, he comes back to San Francisco, and. Again, the expense of making these kinds of trips was, was, was gathering on him. He had to find ways to make more money at these adventures. So he, kind, he comes up with the idea of going up in a balloon, jumping out of the balloon with a parachute, and falling back down with a parachute. People will pay more money to see that than just going up in a balloon, because now more people have seen just going up in a balloon. He comes back to San Francisco and finds this gentleman, Thomas Baldwin, who was doing a tightrope tight act uh, at the Cliff House in San Francisco on the west side near the beach there with a little tightrope that went all the way up to the rocks and back. And he's well known for doing these kind of crazy tightrope walks uh, over, the, over the ocean. Very brave man, very shrewd capitalist. So Baldwin goes, wow, you know, I heard that this guy Van Tassel has this parachute idea. I wanna be in on the act. And together they, they team up to design parachutes in what's the mechanics pavilion um, in downtown San Francisco now. This is, uh, this is no longer around. Very tall building from back then with big rafters to jump from with different weights. So they tried different types of material that for the churches. I think that church is still around. That's one yeah, of the, the church might be in the background there. Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, this is an amphitheater now. Um, but they tried to, uh, to make, make different parachute shapes, uh, realized it's a good idea to have a hole at the top. And so you don't have that oscillation on the way down. You can have the, the parachute come down safely. And they start making these experiments with, with um, big ballasts, big sandbags and things at the beginning. Then they get the idea of maybe jumping themselves on the rafters to make sure it's going to work. And that works. And now you have to really test it with something. So they go up on a tethered balloon, one of Van Tassel's tethered balloons. They tie a dog to the parachute and they push the dog over the side. And sure enough, the dog survives the 3,000 foot fall. With the parachute, probably not a very happy dog. But now the question is, who's going to go up and do this parachute jumping first, Van Tassel or Baldwin? And Baldwin was clearly the more experienced um, exhibitionist. So Baldwin volunteers for the job. He goes to a local trolley company and convinces the trolley company to pay a dollar per foot for as however high they want him to go up 
to make this parachute jump. Uh, and, and in 1887, $1,000 was $30,000 today. So it's a lot of money to go do this. And they arranged to do this at one of the trolley terminus so that the trolley company is going to make money because everyone in town is going to want to see this happen. They're going to make money. Pay me a little bit of it, and I'll go up and do the, do the jump. Um, so they do this on the January 30th of 1887 near the Cliff House uh, using Van Tassel's tethered eclipse balloon, this very large balloon. And this is likely the first successful parachute uh, in the Western America. Uh, again, probably the first since that early 1819 uh, parachute jump in New York. There aren't many pictures of it. This is the only set of pictures where we're able to find uh, at, the, at the San Francisco History Center. And you can see um, uh, here that this is Baldwin standing on the side of the basket here with the parachute attached to the balloon in a very sort of precarious position. As soon as he jumps, the weight of Baldwin is going to pull this parachute loose from the balloon. And you can see it down here on the right side with a very, very light, you know, very loosely controlled your Baldwin right there where my cursor is. And the balloon now going skyrocketing up because of the weight of Baldwin is no longer attached to the balloon. Um, and this is, you know, balloon floats down elsewhere on its own. This was a success. Uh, Baldwin immediately realized that uh, anyone doing this would make a considerable sum of money. He travels to Quincy, Illinois, uh, and then to New York, and then to London, starts making parachute jumps from balloons all over England for huge uh, audiences, hundreds of thousands of people uh, turning out to see this large money coming into Baldwin. And really hardly any of that, if any of it, going back to Van Tassel, uh, leaving sort of Van Tassel on his own, like, you know, the guy that teamed up with me just skipped down. How do I do this? Do I, do I want to jump? I'm really not sure I do. And how do I make money at this art of aerial exhibition? And meanwhile, in England, uh, I was uh, I researched it a little bit more and, and turned out Bald Baldwin patented the parachute. This is a picture of it on the right. Um, it's essentially the same invention he made with Van Tassel with the hole at the top and everything, but there's no record of Van Tassel ever getting any compensation for this uh, British patent. He didn't patent it in America. And there's a nice iron ring here at the bottom that the person holds on to on the way down. With two hands, you hold on to this iron ring. Um, Van Tassel's hired by a, a very young editor, a guy named William Randolph Hearst, a relatively unknown 24-year-old brand new editor of the San Francisco Examiner, to take a photographer aloft in a balloon uh, to take what ends up being the first aerial photos of California from one of Van Tassel's balloons, and then print those photos in the San Francisco Examiner for the rest of the city to see. Because people had now seen people go up in balloons, but they'd never seen what it looks like to be up in the air to look back down on the city. And they repeated this again for the LA Examiner, also owned by Hearst, in, in, later on in 1887, first aerial photos of LA. Some income for Van Tassel. Here's a picture of one of those photos. This is Los Angeles in 1887. You can see the different streets and stuff, and the LA River in the background. Wow. Um, they make another tour. They come back to San Jose, um, and, and Park Van Tassel is scheduled to make a parachute jump, but there's curiously an accident. Maybe it's that he really doesn't want to do the parachute jump because his nerves are getting the better of him. So there's no jump. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a thing. He comes down to San Diego, where I am, makes a successful balloon flight, but no parachute jump here in San Diego. Just a nice balloon flight across the bay. So he's still having difficulty figuring out if he should do these parachute jumps or not. And at that same time, his wife, Clara, was like, you know, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it. So Clara decides to make a parachute jump on July 4th, another Independence Day jump, 1888. And word gets out in Los Angeles that a woman, Clara Van Tassel, is going to do this. And back in that day, just people wouldn't believe that women should be doing these things. It wasn't what women do. Uh, it, this was also the time of women's suffrage and equal rights for women. And so Clara was definitely pushing the envelope for what, you know, showing that women could do exactly what women can do, and they should. Uh, and so word gets out, uh, the police are notified that this is going to happen and, and that they should come stop this event before it happens. Uh, the word gets back to the Van Tassels that the police are coming. So our scheduled uh, uh, ascension was at two o'clock, we're going to go early, and they leave at 1047 so that the police can't catch them. And they go up to 5,000 feet with Park Van Tassel, another friend, and Clara on board. And at 5,000 feet, uh, Clara jumps, uh, giving, giving Park, ne Park nearly a heart attack. And, <laughs> and Clara jumping off the side, she survives this 5,000 foot fall near Pasadena, becoming the first woman to parachute jump in Western US history. And that makes national news and international news that a woman was so brave in California to have done this. It even gets back to England, back to Baldwin. I'm sure Baldwin had read this about this in the papers. Wow. Park is now convinced that uh, not only that he should be doing parachute jumps, but that it's it's just too much for him to handle his wife making these parachute jumps. 
So no more parachute jumps for Clara, unfortunately. And he goes on to Portland without Clara and uh, tries to make a balloon jump at Portland, but there's another accident. So, okay, is it really an accident? Is it this park again? He goes to Seattle and finally makes the first parachute jump. But uh, the parachute, as he jumps, the parachute doesn't open for the first 500 feet of his fall. So pretty terrifying. And then all of a sudden it opens tremendously fast and he's hanging onto this iron ring, barely hangs onto the iron ring, still, still makes the whole jump and lands in the water at the foot of Seattle there and gets rescued from the water safely. Comes to San Francisco, February of 1889, makes another jump, his second at the Cliff House. 10,000 people there seeing if he's gonna do it or not. He does it. And again, this parachute barely opens and then finally opens tremendously fast. It's just not for Parkman Tassel. It's too, too depth defined, too crazy, too terrifying. He doesn't want to do it anymore. They might want to replace that iron ring. <laughs> Something yeah, exactly. And it's not clear if they were hooked to it or, you know, but, but in these particular instances, it is clear they, even if they were hooked to it, it was so severe that they would, you know, almost lose their grip. And in some cases would be hanging by one, one hand. Uh, this is a scene from one of these kinds of events near the Cliff House in San Francisco. He is hired by Salt Lake City to come and do these parachute jumps in 1889. Um, he travels all the way there at great expense. You can see in the, even in the advertising, they say, you know, Great Van Tassel has been engaged at great expense. So they're advertising the fact that they paid him a lot of money. Uh, and he arrives in Salt Lake City, but he realizes he brought the wrong balloon. He brings Clara's balloon instead of his balloon. And Clara's balloon is too small for his uh, large, large weight. Uh, so he also finds that there's competitors doing the same thing. There's a guy named James Price and a lady named Millie Viola making parachute jumps at the same time in the same place. Got competitors now. Uh, more people are picking up on the idea of making this their living. So what's he gonna do? He's already been hired. He goes to a bar and he's trying to figure out what to do. And there's a guy in the bar who's like looking at the advertising for this great fantastic and he's like, this guy's a fraud, it's never gonna happen. You know, right? And he overhears this. He goes to the guy and says, you know, hey, look, I'll give you 400 bucks. I'm Park Van Tassel. I'll give you 400 bucks if you go do this. Like, I can't do it. I'm too, well, I'm too heavy for this balloon, but you look like you're going to do it just fine. And this guy, Dudley Crocker, and says yes to 400 bucks, having never it's been in a balloon money. before. Yeah, exactly. Never been in a balloon, never parachuted, never done anything with aviation. So um, he goes up, goes up so high, he goes past the clouds, and he jumps, and he comes back down through the clouds, miraculously, beautiful uh, parachute descent lands in Great Salt Lake and gets rescued. And everyone's amazed that the park, that this Park Van Tassel was so good at making such a great parachute jump they didn't know was actually Dudley Cochran. And he owned up to that several years later in a newspaper article in Nebraska. And uh, it was kind of $400 of great money, but also hush money. Uh, so Park Van Tassel, again, wonderful stuff. It wasn't really him. Uh, he goes back to Albuquerque, this time with another friend, a guy named Joe Lawrence, now as Joe Van Tassel, Van Tassel, Park Van Tassel's brother, but it's not really his brother, it's just Joe Lawrence, his aeronaut that's been pay, being paid or gets a cut to do the, the, uh, the parachute jumping for him. They try to do this in July 4th of 1889, and it doesn't work. They can't get the parachute to release. So they leave Albuquerque almost kind of as frauds now. This, this hero of Albuquerque is uh, kind of shoot out of town as not being, a, not being fair, not being, not being a valid guy. So on the way back to the Bay Area, they practice making jumps at different towns, at Santa Monica and Los Angeles, at Fresno and Visalia, making balloon flights and parachute jumps to practice. And they get, well, by the time they get back to San Francisco, they're good. Joe Lawrence knows what he's doing. Uh, Baldwin is now also back in America making these kinds of same exhibitions throughout America for paying customers. And it's kind of a race to see which city they can get to next to get the biggest crowd. Uh, he has difficulty, Baldwin, in Albuquerque and finally makes a successful ascension and parachute jump. But Park and Joe realize that they have something here and they should take it to the world. So they first go to Hawaii. They travel out to Hawaii by ship. And Joe Lawrence makes the first successful parachute jump in Hawaii's history, a short flight at Kapi'olani Park near Diamond Head. Mm -hmm. They make a second flight, uh, September, uh, September no, uh, sorry, November 16th uh, for the king. The King Kalakaua's birthday was September, so it was November 16th. And they realize that you know, we, we're here, we should make a nice jump for the king, wouldn't it be wonderful? But unfortunately, Joe Lawrence goes up in the balloon and the trade winds were really strong that day. So they get blown out to sea faster than they expected. And Lawrence releases from the balloon, but still gets blown out to sea. Uh, both the balloon, the parachute, and Joe Lawrence land in the water off of Pearl Harbor. And Joe Lawrence is never seen again. He drowned as a part of that adventure. Um, these were not gas balloons. These were smoke balloons. They were hot air balloons that were inflated over a large uh, fire, if you will. And, Big coals were used to hold the balloon 
so it wouldn't burn. And then you capture that hot air and smoke inside the balloon. So the balloon's going to come back and land anyway without the parachute. If it's a one-way mission. You're going to go up in this balloon. You better parachute down. So unfortunately, um, unfortunately, he perished as a part of this adventure. Uh, and while they were trying to rescue him, they noticed that there were a lot of sharks out in the water off Pearl Harbor that day. And so uh, immediately the newspapers uh, correlated the two and said he must have been eaten by sharks. And they were they, the gruesome tales got even more gruesome. He would, the sharks were leaping out of the water, jumping at him as he was coming back down. You know, it was pointless. Here's, here's a, a picture of the event, a uh, drawing of the event from a French newspaper. Um, and it also considered uh, generated considerable confusion about which Van Tassel had perished because the world now knew Park Van Tassel, but no one knew of this Joe Van Tassel guy. So people around the world were reporting that Park Van Tassel had passed away. And it took Clara back in Oakland to tell the reporters, no, it was actually Joe that had passed away. So um, here they are now wondering in Hawaii, how do you continue on as the aeronaut had just passed away? But they do continue on. They go to, to Sydney, Australia by boat, uh, both Park Van Tassel and the manager, Frank Frost. And they meet up with that James Price, James Price guy, the same guy that was in Salt Lake City as one of their competitors. Clearly, they had already arranged with James at that time to team up and make a tour of Australia with parachutes, uh, balloons and parachutes. They travel all over Australia, uh, starting in Sydney and then Melbourne, uh, Ballarat, Bendigo, Adelaide, up to Brisbane, up the North, uh, Gold Coast, up to Townsville, and off to Southeast Asia. And I'm not going to belabor it, but they, they make lots and lots of great balloon flights and parachute jumps. James Price is now another unusual brother of Park Van Tassel, this great family of ballooning uh, masquerading as James Van Tassel. These are some of the earliest parachute jumps in Australia's history. They hire two trapeze artists, the Frieda sisters, who are Americans living in Sydney doing trapeze work as a living. And these sisters also wonder, why is it that the men can only have this fun? Why can't we have the fun? And this is, again, in a time of women's rights. So they decide to get trained and, and start making parachute jumps too. And Valerie becomes the first woman in Australia's history to make a parachute jump, likely the first woman to fly any in anything in Australia's history. Her sister Gladys uh, makes a second jump uh, just a week later. And now both of these girls are national heroes immediately that they were able to do this uh, and survive. And everyone in Australia wants to see them. And the Van Tassel family now of, of both brothers and sisters uh, uh, growing, uh, you know, but uh, making a lot of money as they go from town to town. They make huge flights uh, in these cities, hundreds of thousands of people showing up at a time, paying large sums of money to watch this happen. As they get to Adelaide, um, Van Tassel and James Price have a falling out about how to manage this troop and keep it going through Australia. They split with Van Tassel and the two girls going on to Queensland and James Price, Frank Frost, and Millie Viola, the same parachutist that was in Utah, now in Australia, continuing on with jumps uh, throughout Victoria and Australia. Van Tassel continues on, as I said, to Brisbane. During Brisbane, during one of these uh, ascensions of the balloon getting it set up, they have these very large poles to help keep the balloon erect over the hot fire to, to get it inflated. And unfortunately, one of these poles falls right into the crowd and hits a young boy and kills him rather instantly uh, as they're watching this balloon. And that tragedy creates a, uh, a court case uh, to see if there's any malice in wrongdoing. There wasn't, it was an accident, uh, but they do require Van Tassel to have a larger separation of the crowd from the, the inflation area for, so that that wouldn't happen again. Yeah. They continue on to Townsville. Um, they make a great flight there. There's all sorts of different complaints because it was a Sunday. Should they be doing these kinds of things on the day of rest or not? It's, it, it, these kinds of things happened in the newspaper. It was almost that the politics around doing balloon exhibitions became more of interesting than the balloon exhibitions themselves. But there is a street named uh, Van Tassel Street in Townsville for these, these early flights by women in, in 18. They go to Southeast Asia, to Indonesia, Singapore, Shanghai, the Philippines, to Burma, and off to India. Again, I'm not going to belabor all of them all, but Gladys is now making these flights with Park. Uh, she makes the first balloon ascension and parachute jump in Shanghai's history, probably the first woman to fly in China. And because Park is now gallivanting around the world with two women, uh, Clara Korkendall back in Oakland is granted a divorce from Park. So there goes wife number three. Uh, there are other competitors that are doing this in competition, racing around the world, trying to get to big cities to make balloon flights. Um, some of them are doing them for the emperor of Japan. At that time in the 1890s, Japan was 
going under what's called the restoration, trying to take Western technology and, and bring it in, um, mainly for military purpose, but also just uh, other purpose, uh, bringing Japan up to speed with the West. And so a lot of these jumps were made for the emperor to show how it could be done. Mm -hmm. um, but really, Van Tassel is now on a tour, a, really, a real serious race to get, to get to funding. How do you get on that boat and get to the next place to make money? He goes to India, all these different locations with red dots are where they jump from. There's probably many more. These are the ones I was able to locate. Um, Valerie rejoins the troop very briefly. Uh, they make several demonstrations, but then Gladys and Valerie both marry wealthy Indians leaving Park to wonder, how am I to make money? Am I going to have to make these jumps now? I'm stuck in India. What do I do? You know, how do I keep going? He goes to London and he arranges with a newspaper there to make a very large balloon, a new balloon, to travel on a journey across all of India from Calcutta to Bombay. Uh, and while that balloon is being made before it's shipped to India, he returns to India, to Bombay, with another parachutist, a new woman, uh, a lady named Jeanette Rummery, who's masquerading as Jeanette Van Tassel. And now Jeanette is uh, quite younger than Park. So it's not clear if Jeanette is his wife or his daughter, clearly not a sister. Uh, but in the papers, it's one or the other. And there's no records of them actually having been married. We can't find any marriage proceedings, but it's possible that they were. They make many parachute jumps all around India in late 1891 to 1892. Um, and there's a picture of Jenny on the left and a very dapper Park Van Tassel on the right at a studio in Calcutta at the time. They get to Dhaka. Dhaka now is currently uh, the main city in Bangladesh, but back then it was still India. Uh, and Jenny launches in a balloon uh, from a, a, a palace um, in town. Very beautiful launch in the balloon. Jumps from the parachute, it's gorgeous, everyone's amazed. And she ends up landing in a tree, uh, in this very, very large tree in a large park in Dhaka. Uh, they bring some bamboo poles to try to rescue her from the tree. And as they are doing so, one of the poles breaks and she falls all the way out of the tree uh, and suffers a really serious injury. And unfortunately dies two days later from that tragic injury suffered from the fall. So yet another tragedy on the Van Tassel tour, um, and she's buried in Dhaka. And she's still considered by people in Bangladesh to be the first person to ever fly in that country. Uh, she's, she's revered as their first, first pilot, but unfortunately a tragic accident on the first day. That also makes international news. And because no one had really heard of Jeanette Van Tassel, but they had heard of Gladys and Valerie, many reporters attributed the death to either of those two, but that was wrong. And it just, you know, the word goes around the world the wrong way and they have to correct it. And it's a, it's a big thing. Van Tessel continues on. He makes other uh, exhibitions through India. He marries again. It's probably true he divorced again because by 1894, he's on his own again, traveling to Sri Lanka. He makes the first balloon flight and parachute jump in Sri Lanka's history. So he's the first aeronaut in Sri Lanka. He's still jumping at that point. <laughs> he's still jumping because he's got to make money. He keeps going, right? He goes off to Africa, to Zanzibar here, then to South Africa, up to Persia, makes jumps for the Shah of Iran, uh, goes to Russia and then into Europe. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go through the long history of these things, but he comes through all these experiences, really knowing how to be a balloonist and a parachutist. He's really got the art down right. He comes back to India and spends five years in India making more parachute jumps, but then suffers a stroke in, in October of 1900 uh, and decides to return to California, probably for healthcare reasons and also because the world was going through a global depression at that time. It's very, very difficult to make money in aerial exhibition. So why not return to California? And he comes back to the Bay Area, which was now his home. And he realizes that technology has changed. When he left, people were just happy to have seen someone go up in the air, but now people are experimenting with dirigibles, big sausage shaped balloons with power uh, to try to navigate through the air. And people are also experimenting with gliders and with powered aircraft uh, that might be on the horizon. Um, so there's this gentleman, August Greith, in the Bay Area, who had developed his own dirigible as early as 1904, uh, 1903, actually, sorry, and had hired Thomas Baldwin, the same Thomas Baldwin, to be his aeronaut, to be able to control this dirigible. So Baldwin learns all about dirigible design through Greith. And he realizes that the propellers that are being used are tragically uh, inefficient. They're basically flat plate ceiling fan airfoils that aren't going to propel much at all. And, and he needs to come up with a better airfoil to make that really work. 
who is the guy in the Bay Area who knows all about airfoils and, and curved surfaces? It's John Montgomery. So he goes down to Santa Clara College and works with Montgomery to perfect in a wind tunnel, to perfect pr propeller design specifically for dirigibles. And at the same time, he proposes to Montgomery, why don't we take balloons with your glider underneath them and release just like the parachutes. Instead of jumping out, you release with a glider. People are going to pay a lot of money to see the glider. You get to come down in the glider. I'll make the balloons. We'll team up. We'll go around the nation. We'll make a lot of money. And Baldwin says, sounds great to me. They sign a contract. But right after that, I mean, like right after that, uh, Baldwin uh, now has the concept for a dirigible, has the, the propeller design for a dirigible. He goes to Los Angeles, starts building the California Aero dirigible, brings that back to the East Bay uh, in near Oakland, test flies it there, and then goes off to the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 and wins first prize for the longest dirigible flight, a $100,000 prize. None of that credit going back to Montgomery or Greece. And so Montgomery ends up suing Baldwin, Baldwin ends up countersuing Montgomery. And while all that's happening, Montgomery's like, you know, I don't need the Baldwin guy. Who in the Bay Area knows anything about balloons? And he finds that Van Tassel's around. So he teams up with Van Tassel to help with the ballooning for these glider releases. So a couple of the glider releases were Van Tassel balloons, not, not, uh, not Baldwin balloons. You know, I'm, I'm gonna interject here. Um, yeah, you, you told us the story, you know, right, in, our, right. in a previous book, previous time, right. and we all were scratching our heads, like, "What gliders and balloons?" Just I know how does it work? Next? How does it, I, exactly, exactly. Now, and, and now we know the connection. And now you know, understand. And, it, and so this is this was a very interesting thing. So when I was researching the Montgomery story, I got to the same point you did. It's like you know, gliders from balloons. That really seems complicated. I get it though. If you can get up high. Uh, you're going to have a really, really long glide. I mean, these the glides were like 20 minute glides from 4,000 feet. And so it was a long glide. Clearly, the longest duration glides anytime, anywhere in America at that time, even propelled flights were very short in 1904. You weren't going to stay up for 20 minutes. So you get a really a chance to really test control and test, um, test your theories about flight with a long flight like that, far more than just jumping off a hill and fly, flying down to the bottom of the hill. Yeah. But, um, but it really was this parachute concept that led to this idea. And during the work for the Montgomery book, this Van Tassel name came up and I had no idea who the Van Tassel guy was, but I kind of just put that aside and focused on the Montgomery thing. And later um, I teamed up with a gentleman named Dick Brown, who's a hall of fame balloonist uh, and another gentleman, Rick Van Tassel, who's the Van Tassel sort of family historian. And they had collected papers about Park Van Tassel, PDFs, uh, but hadn't pieced it all together in this whole story of this this jigsaw puzzle of this pathway through the world. And so I was like, well, that sounds neat. I'd learn more about that. And that's, it's got the Montgomery connection. So this kind of led me into this whole book, this this one connection. Rabbit to, hole. <laughs> exactly, this one rabbit hole. So, um, so Van Tassel, by that time, you know, he realizes two things. One, um, the Great Quake happens of 1906, and that really curtails almost all of the technology that was happening in the Bay Area it was so far advanced from many other cities in California and in the West, but the quake put it back. Um, so now he has to realize he has to make just make money, focus on making money. And he's also now the elder statesman. He's an older man. He's traveled the world, which many people hadn't done at that time. And ballooning is fun. So why don't I help set up recreational clubs to get people into ballooning? And by 1909, He's already helping to set up two clubs, the Pacific Aero Club and the Oakland Aero Club. They're really Bay Area's first two recreational clubs, like the South Bay Soaring Society of the time. Um, and here's this elder statesman helping it all happen. He makes a very large balloon called the City of Oakland with several impressive flights across the Bay Area starting in August of 1909. And the very first flight was a passenger flight with a gentleman named Vander Nalen. Uh, and they, they took off from Oakland and landed in Pleasanton, but the landing in Pleasanton wasn't the problem. It was the 40 knot wind that was in Pleasanton that was the problem, which didn't make it very pleasant. And so landing in a balloon in any wind is, is, is a is difficult adventure. They had a lot of problems getting that landing to happen, got bruised and, and broken on the way in, but um, still a very impressive flight. Here's a picture of what it looked like in Oakland in 1909 with people gathered around to watch the spectacle of this amazingly huge balloon. This is now gas, back to being gas balloons again. And they launched and they just missed the steeple of the church next door uh, off on their adventure. He also helps with some balloon races. These are some of the earliest balloon races in America's history, uh, mainly again in the, in the Bay Area in 1910. They have their own harrowing adventures of landing in the Bay, landing in swamps, getting drugged through swamps, uh, broken legs, 
all sorts of craziness happens, but it's, it's you know, good adventures. Um, he's hired by the Goodyear Rubber Company to help with the advertising of Goodyear tires on top of, of very large buildings in San Francisco. It's a windy place. So they decide to make a banner, a, a blimp, that's a balloon shaped, like a dirigible shaped advertising balloon. And Van Tassel's the one charged with doing that. So really the first sort of dirigible type things for advertising for Goodyear were done by Van Tassel. And he marries again, a lady named A.F. Barr, who we're not sure who she was. They marry in Oakland in 1912. Just like we're having to go through today, a pandemic. Back then, there was a pandemic in 1918, the flu. And uh, Van Tassel, now an older man, uh, probably staying inside much of the time. Like we didn't, they didn't have vaccines back then, so uh, pretty much stuck. And his income now is dwindling. So how do I make anything, any kind of income? He thinks about this mechanical toy of a slingshot to slingshot a, a, a toy parachute up in the air for kids. This gets patented in 1921. It's not clear if he had ever made any money on it or not. And he ends up being a caretaker at a very large estate uh, near, near Santa Cruz uh, in the Great Depression. Uh, but again, by, by the late 1920s, he's now a pretty old man. He, in 1930, he moves back to live with his sister in Oakland. And in, in October of 1930, he, he unfortunately dies of a heart attack at that house in Oakland. And that, that passing makes national news that the great Van Tassel, this Professor Van Tassel of ballooning, had passed away. Um, but they incorrectly attributed his name as being Parks Van Tassel, or that he had his first parachute jump in Kansas City, which was wrong. Everything about the story was wrong, but that he had had this fabulous life was the only correct part. Um, so I just want to close by saying that, you know, he has this great, great flight in Albuquerque that starts his whole journey. And it really opened up the American West for ballooning and parachuting. And not only that, but he also brought all of that technology back to Oakland, having traveled the world and introduced Oakland and the Bay Area to ballooning and parachuting. And throughout that whole time, it was this amazing life in motion, this, this continual movement of city to city. How do I make money on this journey? Kind of like a rock star going from town to town, which made it a very difficult puzzle piece to put together, um, but we were happy to do so. Uh, and 30 years after his passing in 1960, a gentleman named Joseph, Joseph Kittinger went up in a very high altitude balloon over 100,000 feet and jumped out with a spacesuit and returned to Earth by parachute, uh, something that Van Tassel would have never dreamed of, but they did that right over New Mexico again. And so really, New Mexico has this amazing connection to ballooning. So does Oakland. Uh, and both of them have, they share that connection through this gentleman, Park Van Tassel, that I wrote about. So um, one of the things that I try to hope to do with this book uh, in the next year, there's two, two things I desperately want to do. I'm trying to get the word out about his accomplishments, but it turned out that when he was buried in 1930, the family really didn't have much income at all. It's the Great Depression. They buried him in a grave in Evergreen Cemetery in Oakland in an unmarked grave. And clearly his life uh, and history are, are deserving of a marker on this grave. So I'm trying to raise money uh, to get that grave marker put there next year and have a nice big celebration of him. And in addition, the location of his first ascension in New Mexico's history it's currently a parking lot in downtown Albuquerque. And I had the pleasure of visiting the parking lot three weeks ago, but it's just a parking lot. And no one knows that this is where aviation started in New Mexico. That deserves its own marker. And of course, all the women that were associated with him that he introduced aviation to around the world and started women's aviation everywhere, that also deserves recognition around the world too. So I started a GoFundMe called the Park Van Tassel Grave Marker. You can, you can look it up. Uh, you can use the QR code that's there below to go to it if you like. I, I welcome any donations you can. It doesn't have to be a large amount, but just, just something that will help us get that marker on his grave in Oakland uh, and preserve this Bay Area history for future generations to know where he's at and what happened to him. I think it's really important. Um, and so this book captures all of that history. If you're interested, you can order it through the University of New Mexico Press. You can also get it online at, at Amazon. It's got a glossary of ballooning terms because as a glider guy, I didn't really know much about ballooning. Um, and so I help you with those terms too. Lots and lots of people to thank all around the world. Of course, during COVID, I did all of this research uh, virtually, uh, most of the research virtually, had the pleasure of going to Stanford and using their archives too, great, great resources for newspapers. Um, but all around the world, uh, speaking to archivists and, and getting photos and finding out all about his history uh, was its own reward. Uh, and finally, um, the thanks to the 
uh, uh, Albuquerque International Balloon Museum. They have a new exhibit on Park Van Tassel at the airport in Albuquerque. They'll also have an exhibit coming up hopefully next year in the Balloon Museum on Park Van Tassel. And my partners in crime uh, really helped me pull all this together. Without their help, it wouldn't have been possible. So thank you so much. That's terrific. Thank you, Gary.